be afraid And I don't want to fear the storm Just because I hear it roar No, I don't want to fear the storm No, I don't want to fear the storm Good morning. Great to be with y'all. I love that we are singing a song about peace and that Lauren's going to be preaching about peace because, uh, as some of you know, we've been in Israel, Emma and I and Steady and Kelvin and Tim were in Israel the last 12 days. And, um, uh, you know, the standard greeting there is shalom. And uh, it's just good to, uh, that's, that means peace in Hebrew. And so it's just good to be together. Uh, we uh, walked all kinds of places 
uh, when we were in Israel. And one of the places we walked was on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And it was incredible to walk there because that's like, you, there are a lot of touristy spots in Israel, but that's the one place where uh, you walk where you know that Jesus and the disciples walked up those steps to get into the temple, to go up to the temple uh, when they were there. And it's just an incredible thought. And so let's, uh, let me just pray for us as we come to this place. Father, we thank you that there are places in this world that are real that we can go and see where you walked. And Lord, we thank you that um, through scripture and through our experience with you, you invite us to walk with you that we can walk alongside and walk in your footsteps that we might see um, you and might see all of the life that you offer to us in this day. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you guys could stand with us, please. So, yes, yeah, so as, uh, as Chip just mentioned, we are speaking about peace. We're talking about peace. And something that I was thinking about um, you know, I normally, whenever this, to whatever topic comes up, it just saturates my life, my thoughts, my everything, which then in turn saturates my friends' lives because, and my wife and everybody else, because that is uh, what is just flowing in and out of my head and heart. And as I was thinking about peace um, and, and, and in some of our conversations, just the idea if, if I said, hey guys, um, you know, if, you're, if things feel crazy and I said, uh, hey, just don't think about that, or, or don't be scared, or don't worry, or don't be anxious. Um, man, those are easy words to say, but it's hard just to take on that. You just shift and be like, oh, okay, now I'm not anxious, or now I feel peaceful. Um, so each of us has something in our lives that, that robs, robs us of joy, robs us of, of peace. Um, and uh, when we call that out, and we know what it is, we, if we anchor it back into the Lord and we know who God is and we know that God says that if we'll stay our minds on the Lord that he will give us his peace um, but it takes us knowing who the Lord is uh, and understanding that he is great enough to give us peace so it isn't just like I mean I could listen to worship music blasting and drive down the road and still be like frustrated with somebody that's not giving me peace um, so at that moment, so it's not just words that come across your lips. It's not just things that come into your ears. It's something that is in your heart and that you believe. Um, so yes, yeah, so all of these songs that we're working through um, and that we're going to put on our lips today, I just challenge everyone to imagine what it is, what it is that's giving you fear, that's, that's robbing you of joy, that is giving you worry, and sing these songs um, as God's truth and as your declaration over those things, um, because they're different for all of us. So this is a song we know um, well. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes Steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know no, I won't be shaken no, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love no, My fear doesn't stand a chance When I no, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When she no longer has a place to hide, and I am not a captive to the lies, and I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. And my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
no worry. And no weapon, no worry will prosper against me. No darkness, no evil will tease or torment me. No weapon, no worry will prosper against me. No darkness, no evil will tease or torment me. No power, dominion to war name is given. My fortress, my freedom, my refuge, my Jesus in all power. Again, welcome to you. It's great to have y'all here this morning. Great to be here together. I uh, want to just mention to you, if you haven't got a bulletin, uh, they're out in the foyer every Sunday morning. We do them about once a month. And uh, if you need one right now, I'm holding my hand up and I can throw them to you from here if anybody needs one. But this is a great, uh, great way for you to kind of dig in and find out what's going on on any given Sunday as well as just during the week. And I'm not going to go through everything that's in there. But I want to just highlight a few things. As I mentioned uh, just a, a little bit ago, uh, just got back from Israel. Uh, it was an incredible trip. I actually want to go back next March and then pray in through. Um, if you're interested in that, you can just grab me and talk to me about it. But I'd really, I think it'd be incredible to take a Waypoint group uh, to Israel next March. It's the second time I've been. And we just had an incredible time. I'll show you. I thought of all the places Tammy and Kelvin went. It was a small group, just 18 people. A friend of mine had organized this trip. And I thought about all the places uh, to get a, a picture of the four kind of waypoint folks uh, to show y'all kind of the experience that we had. So this is the picture that uh, we got for you uh, from the bus, and uh, which is where we spent a lot of time. But it was an incredible trip. I lost five pounds, uh, and that was just because Emma made me shave my beard, uh, trim it back. So uh, it was an incredible trip. It really was, and would love to uh, again. If you want to, if you're interested in going to Israel, whether next March or at all, talk to. One of the four of us, we'd love to talk to you about it. A uh, couple other things just to mention. Uh, Church Center is where we kind of have all of the events and all of the groups and all of the goings on at Waypoint during the week. And if you are not familiar with it, we'd love for you to get familiar with it. I actually uh, have put out a boot camp uh, idea that we were going to do next Wednesday, but nobody signed up yet. So I'm assuming everybody knows what they're doing on Church Center. Uh, but if you, if you want some help with that, we'd love to help you with that. That really is kind of the, the online hub where we store uh, all of what's going on at Waypoint and the way you can get connected uh, with people starting there. Uh, and Youth are going bowling after the service today, and, and what we're going to do is have you just gather. If you're interested in going, even if you haven't signed up, we'd love, if you're uh, you know, in, the, in the youth ages or a leader, we'd love for you to just come meet up here after the service. Uh, Noah's going to go over a couple of things, and then they'll take off around 12 to go bowling uh, so we'd love for you to do that. Again, even if you haven't signed up, feel free to come up and do that. Spring luncheon for the ladies is going to be on April the 16th at 11.15 a.m. out in the foyer. And you can hit the QR code and sign up on Church Center for that or talk to Jessica uh, Marriott if you're interested in coming to that. That's going to be a great chance for the women to just to talk through uh, kind of coming off the incredible retreat that they had. Uh, they're going to talk through kind of what's ahead for 2023 and going forward. So I'd love for you to join us for that. A couple of other uh, Holy Week things. That, again, all the Holy Week stuff is in the bulletin, so I'm not going to go through it all. 
But if you're interested, Ten and Bray was a really intimate uh, gathering that we had um, last year on Maundy Thursday. And it was an incredible service. I will just tell you, it really was. You have a chance. Uh, uh, I will show you the couple of nails. Uh, there's a cross that's up, and you come kind of nail nail some stuff to the cross. It's just a, a kind of a, a um, candlelit service in which you just kind of reflect on what it means for the Lord to have gone through that, that few days of heading to the cross uh, as we head into Easter weekend. And we invite you to come to that. If you're interested, again, you can sign up out in the foyer. There's a... a, a flyer for it, or you can hit that QR code here. That's a great service to come to. 717, yes. It says 717 because we want to make sure we get enough dark to make the, the cross uh, kind of be fun to lit up for the candlelight. Uh, and it's at 717 because I have found that saying 7 o'clock or 730 doesn't work as well. So, yeah. Uh, Easter sunrise service. It's going to be a little bit after the sunrise, but that will be at 7 o'clock out in the front courtyard. Uh, so set on Easter morning, we'll have 7 o'clock sunrise service. That's a great service. I invite you to come to that. Bring a chair if you have one. We'll have some chairs out there as well. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll have our regular chapel service. I will tell you, please read the Wednesday email regarding parking because it would really help. Uh, Easter, we're going to, I think, be pretty full, and it would help if you can park in some of the other uh, options that are not very, a couple, three minutes away as a walk. So with that in mind, let me just pray for us. Um, I realize as we get to the confession that I don't think I did a new prayer. So I'm just going to pray for us and give you 30 seconds uh, to just be with the Lord yourselves and see what he has to say to you in this moment. And so let's just go to, to the Lord, and then we'll, I'll give you 30 seconds after I pray. Father. We thank you that we can come into this place after a busy week, that you bring peace, that you are our protector. And Lord, we confess that we can be on Providence Road listening to worship song at full volume and get distracted by somebody cutting us off. We can get distracted by somebody saying something in a text or in an email that completely derails are getting close to you. Lord, we confess that our minds can wander, that our hearts can wander, and we ask, Lord, that you would reveal to us your presence in such a way that we would grab hold as we approach Easter, Lord. Let us understand and know and feel your presence in a, in a deep way that would change us forever. And so, Father, right now we just come, each of us individually, silently confess our hearts and our heads to you. Father, we thank you that you are a forgiving God, not just once, not twice, but Lord, you are ever ready to forgive our sin and that you have forgiven us once and all for salvation on the cross. And we thank you for that. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the time when we take an offering and want to just remind you if you're visiting Waypoint for the first time or just a visitor in general, uh, you have no obligation to give. Uh, if you're a member of Waypoint, a partner, you, you feel led by the Lord to give today, that's great. We love that. Uh, but if you're not, just please enjoy the music and just uh, we're glad you're here this morning. And let's continue in worship. Yeah. 
every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus silence Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe. Call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise you, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Welcome into Waypoint. If you are new or you are visiting, we are so glad you are here. If Waypoint is your home, um, we are also so glad that you are here. Our church has been um, in the middle of a sermon series titled Well Versed, in which we are taking verses that we're familiar with, um, verses we may have memorized, verses that just feel very familiar, and we're taking a deeper look at those. Um, and it's been a wonderful exercise in remembering that too often when, we, when we're too familiar with the verse, we can kind of go through it too quickly or too lightly. Um, sometimes there's verses that I have memorized and I feel like I can I kind of go through them almost sing-songy, like, oh, I know this verse. Today we're studying peace, like, peace I give you, peace I leave you. We treat it too loosely. So today we're going to look um, we're going to look at a verse with a little more depth. So we're glad you're here, and we're glad um, you will study God's word with us today. Is this? Can you hear me all right? Okay, because it doesn't sound right in my ears. Um, <laughs> let's begin in prayer, shall we? Would you bow your heads with me, Heavenly Father? I thank you for this amazing, your amazing goodness. Thank you for your unending faithfulness, for your love and your grace. 
Would you pour that out upon us this morning as we draw close to you? Lord, we are here to worship you and you only. Would you position our hearts to be open to receive all that you have in store for us? Bless us this morning with the gift of reading slow. Bless us with the removal of to-do lists and distractions. Would you just erase the outside world for a moment and take us slowly, deeply through your word? Lord, we thank you for preparing this lesson. I thank you for the opportunity to share your message. This message is yours and not mine. May this church hear you and you only. We're here to hear your message. We thank you for the time you've provided for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we are going to be in John. John is one of the gospel writers. Did I do that? Yes. Um, so John is one of, he was a disciple of Jesus. He wrote one of the four gospels. He lived life with Jesus. When Jesus was on the earth in his three years of ministry, John was a part of that. He answered the call to come and follow he walked with Jesus, he talked with Jesus, he heard the teachings with his own ears, he saw the miracles with his own eyes. And John's writing always points to Jesus. John is saying, I had an eyewitness account and I am sharing with you what I've seen so that you will believe. His goal is always believe in Jesus, believe he is the son of God, he is the Messiah, and that he was sent so that we may have eternal life with the Father. So that's John. We also need to look at who he's speaking to um, when we go to our verse, and the context of this verse is really beautiful because it's in the upper room, and John chapters 13 through 14 are considered the upper room, no, 13 through 17, the upper room discourse, these conversations in the upper room are recorded in all four Gospels, and it really shows the importance of the conversations being held. So this is the Thursday evening of what we call Holy Week. Um, and in this setting, he has pulled his disciples aside, and he, Jesus is speaking what is most important. So that's where we find um, our verse this morning. And we will turn to that now. If you have your Bibles, great. Um, go ahead and open those. Um, we're in chapter 14 of John, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace is such a word that we kind of throw around. Um, we make it light. We think, oh, just have some peace. If you're having trouble, just grab hold of peace. Peace is not a light and airy word. It's not a dainty word. Peace has weight. If you just listen to the word itself, peace, it has a calming and a soothing and a comforting that just comes from the sound, listening to the sound of the word peace. It is a weight like an anchor, and it is designed that way to anchor us, to attach us to Jesus and the peace that he provides. It is not the absence of chaos or challenge. Peace does not mean there will not be trials or struggles. Peace does not mean you will not have a hard day. You will not be in a hard season, but peace as an anchor comes underneath that. It comes from the Hebrew word shalom, um, which gives greater definition to the word. word. Shalom is a wholeness, a completeness. It is well-being. Shalom says, from your inner depths, there is a tranquility. There is a deep sense of things being well and as they should be. If you think of the phrase, it is well with my soul, Peace says that no matter what is going on in the world around you, it is well within you. Peace says things don't look good. The situation is far from good. This relationship is not good. The finances are not good. The marriage is not good. The parenting is hard. But peace says God is good. And in knowing God, we have that peace. <clears throat> 
biblical peace, when you dig into the word and you read about it and you study it, biblical peace allows you to sing when there are storms in life that allows you to give praises even when things are tough. So Jesus starts with the word peace. Oh, I messed up the slides already, sorry. Peace, okay, we covered peace. Jesus goes on to say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Jesus is spending time with the disciples. They are in the upper room. He has to have been with the disciples in order to leave the peace with the disciples. It's the same for us. We must spend time in his presence in order for him to leave his peace with us. He's also giving peace as a gift. <clears throat> peace I give to you. He's offering it to the disciples. Peace is never forced upon them. It's never forced upon us. It's simply offered. If you think of peace as an actual gift, the giving of peace, if someone brings you a gift and it's wrapped beautifully tied up in a ribbon, if you place that on the table but never open it, it's lovely to look at it, but it does nothing for you. It will not change you. The peace is there. It's always there. We have to do our part in this. We have to receive the peace in order for it to do its work, in order for it to anchor us when we go out into the world. And we receive peace so much through Scripture tells us we receive peace through obedience, when we're obedient to his word. We receive peace when we surrender to his will. We receive peace when we remain and we abide in him. So peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Then he tells us, I do not give as the world gives. And this is kind of my favorite part, even though I shouldn't have a favorite part, because he's the context of the setting of this when he's saying this, Jesus is in the upper room. We call it Holy Week for them. It was during the time of Passover. And he's telling them, I'm giving you something not as the world gives. The disciples and Jesus entered Jerusalem just a few days prior to this evening. And when they entered, it was, it was right after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So there is all sorts of frenzy around the miracle of Lazarus. There's frenzy around Jesus as the Messiah. And as he enters Jerusalem, this is when we have the palm branches. This is when the crowds are shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They have started this week with praises and blessings. Hosanna literally means save, and in this context, when the crowds are shouting Hosanna, they are acknowledging Jesus as Savior. They are saying, you are the Savior. That's how the week starts. The crowds are giving the blessing. But the very next day, after Jesus is in the upper room, those blessings change to cursing. Those blessings the shouts of Hosanna are going to change to crucify just the next day. Jesus is so aware that as he's teaching this in this secluded space, in this intimate setting with his chosen, very select group, they have heard the blessings of the crowd as he entered the week, and yet the very next day they're going to see him arrested. They're going to witness the crucifixion. They're going to hear the blessings change to crucify. And in a very, very simple, unserious way, the best example of that that I could think of is college football. If you have ever watched college football or you've ever been a fan of college football or if you went to a college with a football team, at the beginning of every season, there is so much hope and there is so much excitement. And this team is going to be the best team ever. And the recruits are amazing. They've recruited, the coach has recruited the most amazing players. They're all five stars. And there's so much excitement. And the entire fan base, the students, the alumni, the town, they love the coach. The coach is the greatest. And everything is great unless, oh gosh, I just did that. Unless the team loses. And then the crowds are not so sure. And that's when the grumbling starts. And that's when all of that enthusiasm at the beginning of the season 
turns to shouts of fire him. And we do that as a group, as a culture, as a society. We do that all day long. We change our minds. And life is going to throw losing seasons at us all the time. Fortunately, God does not change his mind. We like to keep score. We like to, we like to deal in contracts where I say, well, I'm going to do my part if you do your part. Or, well, if you don't do your part, then I'm definitely not doing my part. That is a contract. Thankfully, God does not keep contracts. He keeps covenant. God says, I'm going to do my part even if you don't do your part. God says, I'm going to keep my promise to you even if you break your promise to me. So when Jesus says, I do not give as the world gives, that's what he's saying. He, his gift of peace is unchanging. It is unchangeable. He goes on to speak, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the part that really kind of reminded me not to go through this too quickly, not to keep this verse on the surface, but to really pay attention. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. In the context of these verses, of these chapters, 13 through 17, he tells them about peace, about not having trouble in their hearts, not being afraid. He also tells them, you are going to see things and hear things that will cause grief and mourning. He tells them, you are going to be scattered and scared. He knows what is coming, but yet he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And going through it this week, it was like, okay, it is not a quick memorization, peace be with you. He is saying, peace be with you. Peace, I leave you. Peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. And when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, he is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't hit the panic button. Stay attached to the peace. Don't do it. And it's really that don't do it, don't allow it. Don't allow the things that you're going to see and hear, the things going on around you, don't allow what's outside to disrupt the peace I've given you on the inside. Because the very next day, they are going, he will be arrested. They're going to see him taken from the garden. He will be tried. He will be placed in front of Pilate. The crowds will shout crucify. Jesus knows what's coming. And so in this, knowing what's coming, telling them they're going to be scared, they're going to grieve, he knows the pain that's coming the next day. So it's, peace is not separate from emotions. You still have emotions. The disciples will have emotions. If we don't have emotions, then we're more like robots. It, you have to have emotions in order to feel the love and the joy and happiness. You also have to know the grief and the sadness and the scary. But what he's saying is don't let that take your focus off of me. The disciples are about to have their worlds turned upside down. The man they have devoted three years to, the man they know is the son of God, is about to have the pain of the crown of thorns, the pain of the nails in his hands. He's about to go through the horrific suffering of the cross, yet he is telling them, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And I actually love that this do not let your hearts be troubled is a repeat. The very first words of chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. And anytime God repeats his word, he's saying, pay attention here. So yes, he's telling them about peace, but he's also telling them it's going to get hard. It's going to look scary. And so often that happens in our own lives. These disciples, their world is, is getting turned upside down. It happens to you and I all the time. If we look at the news, if we look at the world around us, there is so much chaos and turmoil. There's turmoil at the job. There's turmoil in your houses. <clears throat> we have chaos and crisis when it comes to our health, when it comes to raising children. It's unavoidable. It's part of life. 
But what he's saying is my peace is there. Remember, the peace is there to steady us in an unsteady world. And the best part is, it's such wonderful preparation. He's preparing the disciples for what's next, for what they're going to see the next day with the crucifixion, what they're going to feel in the days following and even in the years to come. And if you're, read, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, goodness, I haven't prepared myself for peace. I'm in that place of where I just react poorly afterwards. Jesus already has that covered as well. In fact, when he comes back at the resurrection, when he first appears to the disciples, <clears throat> this is where they are. It's in chapter 20, verse 19. When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he says it again, Peace be with you. He's already given them preparation. He said, You're going to be scared. You're going to grieve. You're going to mourn. But have peace. They see it all. They are scared. They lock themselves in a room. And when he comes, he doesn't say, I told you to have peace. He comes and gives them a reminder, peace be with you. The same is for us. He offers us that same peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And I love that we're studying this this week, the week before Palm Sunday, because it's been so, for me, it's been so rewarding to dig through all that goes on for Holy Week. And I would challenge you this week to spend time in that, um, to look at what is happening, what he is saying before he goes to the cross. So what do we do with this first now? Um, I love Waypoint because we often say, well, here is God's word. Now what does it look like in real life? How do we walk this out? How do we take this lesson on peace? How do we take it from the upper room into our daily lives? Well, there was a truck driver in South Carolina who had the perfect answer for this. And I would love to say that when I saw this truck back in, I think it was November, that when I read that, that I was filled with peace and reminded of the peace that I always have. Sadly, I saw that and I immediately thought of my Bible study and I snapped a picture and I sent it to them and I just said, oh, look at how good God is. He just gave us a little nugget. We were actually doing a study on create a heart of peace in me. And after I sent that um, quick picture of peace, uh, there was no peace in our car. We were on 85. It was um, horrendous traffic. I do not do well in traffic. Um, I don't care for the large trucks or the concrete barriers. So we did not have peace in that moment, but the truck driver did offer a very simple solution. If you want to have peace, you must know Jesus. It's right there in black and white. If there is no Jesus in your life, there will be no peace. The world will try to tell you there's all sorts of ways to achieve peace. Follow these five steps. Meditate. Go for a run. Do this, do that. The world will constantly feed you and they'll let you pay for ways to achieve peace. Peace cannot be achieved, ever. Peace must only be received. So if you ever, ever, ever hear a notion of this is how you achieve peace or peace is over there, I'm sorry to say it's not. Peace is only found with Jesus. If there is no Jesus in your life, there will be no peace. We must know Jesus, K-N-O-W. We must know Jesus to know peace. That's it. It's very simple. We like to complicate it. Um, and to know Jesus... The way we do that is the same way we get to know anyone. You spend time with them. And in order to do that with Christ, you, he is the living word, and God gave us his living word. You know Jesus when you are in his presence. You are in his presence when you open his book. And I, do, I think it's wonderful that our Bibles are on our phones, but I have to say, 
you have to open this book. You have to feel the weight of it. You have to sit before your God, open his word. I promise you he will meet you each and every time you do that. You have to hear the crinkle of the pages. You have to see the words that are printed in red. Read his book. There are great ways to reinforce your relationship with Christ. Come to church, listen to sermons. There are so many strong Bible teaching pastors out there. You can find it all on the internet. There are great ways to reinforce it. When we pray, we are in the presence of God. When we listen to worship music, we invite the presence of God in. Get involved in a small group or a Bible study, but you must start with God's word. If you want to know Jesus and you want to know his peace, you must know his word. And that's going to look different for everybody. How you read your Bible, when you read your Bible, how you choose to spend your time with your Bible, that's different for everyone. And that's beautiful. God meets everyone exactly where they are. No two faith journeys are the same. For me, I often just have this sense, my friends have heard this over and over again, it's this sense of, I've got to get alone with Jesus. I mean, it, real, it is like, you need to get alone with Jesus. I've got to get alone with Jesus. And sometimes it's a feeling of needing to get re-centered, re-anchored to him, reattached to his peace. Either life has been moving too fast or I have been moving too quickly through life, and it is time to get alone with Jesus. Other times there has been a sense of preparation. You need to do this. Something is on the horizon. Spend some time with Jesus. Get ready for it. And it, the amount of time doesn't matter. Um, a day with Jesus is awesome. An hour with Jesus is awesome. Anybody can do it anywhere. If you don't have a Bible, we have some out front. Open your Bible, spend time with him. He always meets you there. It's not the where or the when, it's the alone that is important. And I love that in this upper room discourse, the disciples got alone with Jesus, and in that they, prepared, they were prepared for what was to come. When you get alone with Jesus, when you get to know him, when you are in his word, that is when the peace is placed in you. That is when the peace becomes an anchor. And it will steady you for what's to come. I know in my own life, when time is spent in his word, I have so much more peace. I am so much more grounded. And when you start there, when the peace is there first before the storm, when the peace is your anchor, when the peace of Christ is what you can attach yourself to, he will take the hard and the heavy stuff. He will even take the horrible and the horrendous, and he will make it holy. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your message of peace. I would just ask that you would just flood every person hearing this message. Flood them with a new sense of peace. Renew the peace they already have. Use your spirit. Fill them afresh. Lord, may each individual in here go out from this space secure and confident in your peace so that whatever comes at them, that they are sure that you are with them. And may that peace be so strong in them that others notice something different. And may what they notice is you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your message this morning. Thank you for your unending love. In Jesus' name. It's fitting after that message that we gather around the communion table, uh, around that table up in the upper room that Jesus gathered his disciples to celebrate communion. And as Lauren said beautifully, that the peace we get, we can't achieve this. It's something we simply receive. And so we have the opportunity to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That this is a Passover meal. I'm reminded of that as Lauren was preaching, that this meal was celebrated of Passover. That was a day in the Jewish history where there was chaos going on outside the homes and that the Lord would pass over the homes that had gathered in behind 
those doors, that it was a place of peace as chaos was happening around them. And so this meal reminds us of that peace, that this is Christ's body broken for us, that this is Christ's blood spilled for us to give us and to feed us the peace that we long for. So would you join me as we turn to God in prayer over this meal? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just come and speak to our hearts. Lord, I, I pray over this meal, Lord, that you are the creator of the heavens. You hung the stars in the skies and you formed us out of dirt and you breathed life into us. Lord, and you gave us the ability to see you, but we chose to run from you. We rebelled against you, but you did not rebel against us. Rather, you sent your son, Jesus, into this world to chase after us and to find us where we are, to breathe on us the blessing of peace. And so, Lord, we come to this table with hungry hearts, hearts that are hungry to know you and to know your son. And so, Lord, I ask that you would take this bread and would you take this cup and would you transform it from an ordinary use to an extraordinary reminder of your son's love, of your son's willingness to die for our sins, of you bringing us a peace in a chaotic world. And so, Lord, we join together with the disciples to pray together the words you taught them to say, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So on that night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he gathered together all of his disciples. He, he gathered them around table. From north and south and east and west, we come to this table. And on that night, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He gave it to you and to me and those who follow Jesus Christ, saying, take, eat, this is my body that's been broken for you. All the brokenness you feel, the Lord was broken for you. And then after supper, after their meal together, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup, this cup is a sign of a new covenant, not a contract, a new covenant, a new promise that was shed by my blood for the forgiveness of your sins, of my sins. That whenever we eat this bread and whenever we drink this cup, we're proclaiming the saving death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that one day, one day he will come again to make all things new, to bring us shalom, to bring us a peace that passes all understanding. So friends, in a moment, we're going to come and invite you to tear off a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. We're going to set up a third station in the back for the folks in the balcony and in the back as well that you might be able to come at your own pace at your own time. And here's the deal at Waypoint. At Waypoint, we don't go through the motions. And so if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you're here just seeing what this whole Godhead is, I'll invite you, don't feel compelled to come forward because the person sitting next to you is going to do it.
soul. Still. 